in August of 1968, the first 45 record released by the Beatles on their new label, Apple, was entitled A Jew. Hence, the title of our lesson this morning comes from the first line of their hit song, Hey Jew, Don't Make It Bad. Which brings me this morning to our one chapter epistle of Jude. So if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Jude. Now the author is by the letter itself designated as verse 1, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now the James to whom reference is made here was the James highly mentioned in connection with the church in Jerusalem. There is only one James so well known in the first century church as to be identifiable without any qualification. The Apostle James, the son of Zebedee, died too early in the history of the New Testament church to have acquired any status or statue. Being put to death by King Herod Agrippa in Acts chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, and Herod died in 44 AD. So our James this morning was the one of the sons of Joseph and Mary, a half-brother of Jesus in the flesh. Inasmuch as Jude was a brother of James, he too was a fleshly brother of the Lord. The Greek scholar J.W. Roberts writes that the name Jew being simply a variant English spelling for Judas. So Jude is the brother of Jesus that is called Judas in Matthew chapter 13 verse 55 as well as in Mark chapter 6 verse 3. He was not an apostle and in humility he refrains from any mention of his relation to the Lord in the flesh. From the fact that he is mentioned last in Matthew's list of Mary's and Joseph's sons, and second to the last in the list of Mark, we're led to infer that he was either the youngest or the second youngest of the male children. Along with the rest of his brothers, he was an unbeliever in the deity of Jesus during the Lord's personal ministry. However, they being with Mary in the upper room in Jerusalem after the ascension indicates the, that the half-brothers were now convinced of the Lord's claims by his resurrection. When we begin to examine the writing of Jude, very discouraging news had come to Jude as to the state in which some Christians had been drifting from the faith. He starts out to write about salvation. Look at the first part of verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, but he changes direction and wrote in verse 4, certain persons had crept in unnoticed. Those who were long before marked out for their condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These false teachers had slithered into or among the true believers of the New Testament church. Jews epistle is very sharp and severe and speaking against these ungodly intruders who were abusers of the grace of God and deniers of Jesus being exalted. The acts of these apostates brought forth this epistle whose theme is in the last part of verse 3, that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now we have all heard the statement, he who will not stand for something is likely to fall for anything. And that remark well describes 
the religious world today. Very few churches are any longer standing for anything. Many religious groups which once, had, which once held firmly to well-defined doctrines as stated in the Bible are now floundering in a deep, dark sea of uncertainty. Even the teachings of the supposedly unchanging Roman Catholic Church have changed. The medieval theologians had taught that limbo was a place that babies, when they died, not having received water sprinkling or pouring, which they refer to as baptism, went to. However, Pope Benedict in 2007 stated that this concept is only a theological hypothesis and never a defined truth of faith. Well, that brings them closer to the Bible in removing something that is not expressed in any part of the scriptures. However, within the Lord's church in some locations, it is going in the opposite direction in that we have abandoned or simply neglected the never-changing doctrine that characterized the New Testament church by adding to it. But that is not a new issue. Jude dealt with this problem in his little book that bears his name. Now there are a number of interesting things about the book of Jude. It is a one chapter book in the New Testament and there are four. The other three are Philemon, 2 John, and 3 John. It is one of the two New Testament epistles written by one of the brothers of Jesus, the other being James. The book of Jude is very much like 2 Peter chapter 2. Not only is it similar in the theme or problem it deals with, but the same ideas are present in these two chapters. Well, why the similarity? I like the explanation of J.W. Roberts who notes that Peter gives denunciation of the false teachers from within as prophecy. And this is what he writes, that the false teachers would come, while Jude treats the situation as having already developed. Second Peter is thought to be written after the first wave of persecution that had died down under Nero that began about 64 A.D., shortly before Nero died in 68 A.D. For Jude was penned sometime or some years later, possibly a decade or two. We also see that Peter deals with attacks from without persecution, while Jude deals with the attacks from within the false teaching. Perhaps Jude read a copy of Peter's second letter, realizing that Peter's warnings, as well as others, had come true when he writes in verse 17. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken before and by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jude decides to send the same warning to his own circle of influence. The important thing to remember is that both Peter and Jude were guided by the Holy Spirit who felt that the warning was important enough to be repeated in the church, perhaps even to a new generation of Christians. Another interesting and challenging characteristic of Jude is the fact that he quoted from a non-canonical book, the apocryphal book of Enoch in verse 14. Well, does that prove that Jude was uninspired on the one hand or that Enoch was inspired on the other? It proves nothing. Since New Testament writers and preachers sometimes use uninspired material to illustrate, illustrate points that they were making. Paul quoted from pagan poets. He does this in Acts chapter 17. 1 Corinthians 15, as well as in Titus chapter 1, without indicating that they were inspired. So neither Jude nor Paul claimed that these secular writers 
were inspired. Now, one of the attention-grabbing things about Jude is that this book that we have is not the book Jude originally attend, intended to write. As I said earlier, he wanted to write to the brethren about their common salvation, but instead was constrained to write about contending for the faith in verse 3. So why did he alter his plans? Because wolves, as false teachers, had secretly gained admission into the flock of God. An emergency situation existed. Therefore, Jude had to adjust his original plans and address something different from what he had initially proposed. What might Jude have written if he had carried out his original plans? Not sure. But his theme would have been our common salvation as stated in verse 3. And from what, we, what he wrote on parchment, we can deduce what he would have said about that salvation. So let us this morning examine what Jude might have written. First, the great blessings in our common salvation. My thought is that our great blessings would have been Jude's emphasis in the letter that he did not write. Well, what blessings might he have enumerated? It is a great blessing to be among those who are called. In verse 1, Jude speaks of Christians as, To those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. What that means is that you are among the elect. You are the chosen. You are among those called by God. Now, of course, God's invitation is extended to all, to those who would accept, will then find themselves among the called. It is also a great blessing to have been saved by grace. Sometimes, we find here several times, that Jude stresses that salvation is by grace. He speaks of grace in verse 4, of the love of God and of the mercy of Christ in verse 21. Then he concludes by speaking of God as the one in verse 24, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy. So grace went before. We are saved initially by grace. And grace comes after. We will be saved eternally by grace. We are sinful. And we do not deserve salvation. But God saves us even though we do not warrant it. And will save us even though we are not worthy of it. And that is what grace means. It is a great blessing to be able to claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Master. Jude says in verse 4 that some deny our Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. But for us, Jesus is our Lord and Master. He is our ruler. He is our King. And what a privilege it is to follow such a God. And to deny Jesus as Lord and Master means that one has chosen to take Satan as theirs. It is a great blessing to just be saved. That is implied in what Jude is saying here is the fact that he, as well as his readers, were saved. Nothing compares with that. Being saved is better than being healthy being educated, or being rich. It is like being lost and then found. It's like almost drowning, going down for the third time, but then rescued. It's like being cold, dead, but then coming back to warm life. But it is more than any of these things. Really, there is no earthly experience which is comparable to being saved spiritually because no earthly tragedy measures up to being lost because of one's sins, being cut off from God, being sentenced to hell. 
And being saved means to be redeemed from that condemnation. It is a great blessing to know that someday we will be in God's very presence forever and ever. Jude says that we can, in verse 21, be waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And to anticipate being brought, in verse 24, in the very presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. An old preacher who had once been asked what he was being paid says, well, the pay isn't all that good, but the retirement benefits are great. And so it is with all of God's children. Whatever life may bring, the retirement benefits are great. A home in heaven with God always without end. So first, we notice the great blessings. Second, then, we have a common faith is defined by the faith, the common salvation is. Now, notice that Jew is concerned about the faith. Again, he said in verse 3, contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude was concerned about our common salvation, but he found it necessary to write about the faith. The two are connected. One defines the other. If the faith is abandoned, the salvation is lost. What can we know about the faith? It is singular. It is not many, but one. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, verse 5, one faith. No other faith will do. It has been revealed. It has been made known. It has been made public. It was delivered to the saints. Now, the saints did not make it up or figure it out. It was disclosed. It was distributed. It was divulged once for all. No additional revelation was needed or was anticipated. Furthermore, any claim to have latter-day revelation must be rejected today. It was delivered to the saints. The saints, the New Testament church, has custody of the faith. It is the church's duty or mission to proclaim it and to protect it. It must be defended. Saints are told to contend earnestly for the faith. Not just the elders, deacons, preachers, or a few Bible class teachers. But all the saints, the whole New Testament church, listen up. If you refuse to defend earnestly, then you ain't a saint. It must be preserved because the faith can be perverted by false teaching. It has a definite shape and structure. It can be known. It consists of specific statements, propositions, facts that can be defended. Otherwise, how could one know when it was being perverted or changed by false teachers? And so when it needed defending. But you can actually know all the truth of the Bible. The true one faith. Now this brings us to number three. Our common salvation can be lost if we are led astray by false teachers. This, of course, was Jude's primary emphasis in the book that he wrote. Now we may assume that it would have been at least mentioned in the book that he did not write. Jude's letter was about the same kind of people that Peter spoke against in his second chapter, or his second book in chapter 2. Now what did Jude say about such people in the church? In verse 4, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long before marked out for condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness 
and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. They denied the Lord and practiced recklessness. Now Jude goes on to say that they were condemned and bound for eternal destruction. Jude uses the example of the unfaithful Israelites, the rebellious angels, and then the ungodly inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah to prove that God will punish the wicked, starting at verse 5. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that God, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own inhabitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains until under darkness for the judgment of the great day, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Jude is describing their homosexuality are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Furthermore, because of their heinous crimes, they deserve to be destroyed. Jude gave a vivid description of them in verse 8 through 19. Well, what were these people like? They pollute their own bodies. They reject authority. They slander angelic beings. They speak abusively against what they do not understand. They have gone the way of Cain, the heir of Balaam, and the rebellion of Korah, caring only for self. They're grumblers. They're fault finders. They're following after their own lust. They're speaking arrogantly. They're flattering others for their own advancement. They're mockers. They're causing division. Worldly-minded and... They do not have the Holy Spirit. Now, how could they have the indwelling spirit behaving as Jude describes them in verse 8 through 19? No wonder they were blemishes or stains in your love feast, verse 12, and that's like a potluck dinner. No wonder the black darkness has been reserved forever for them in verse 13. We may be assured that if we follow such false teachings, we will lose our salvation and share in their everlasting condemnation. Now to avoid losing our common salvation, three things are necessary. First off, you must look after yourself. Now Jude writes starting in verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. What do you need to do to be assured of your salvation? You said, build yourselves up, pray, keep yourself in the love of God, and wait for the mercy of the Lord. Perhaps the main thing to remember here is that your salvation is up to you. Whether you grow or not, whether you fall away or not, it is up to you and you only. No matter how dangerous false teachers are, they cannot condemn without your cooperation. Secondly, you must look after one another. Look at verse 22 and 23. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. That means that they have spoiled or soiled their robes of righteousness and sin, which we can despise the sin spots that they have embraced since first receiving Jesus as their master and Lord at water baptism. Now it may be that Jude is talking about three degrees of apostasy in departing from the faith. 
the first group, has not really fallen away, but they are leaning in that direction by listening to false teachers. Therefore, they need convincing again of the truth. The second group has embraced the false doctrines, but probably hasn't been involved a long time. By going to them and seeking to bring them back to the Lord, we snatch them out of the fire or save their souls from the second death, as James says in chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. The third group includes those that have been engrossed with the false doctrine for some time, long enough for the church to have withdrawn fellowship from them. However, those who are repentant in this group, the church should now have mercy on them with fear, being careful not to partake of their former uncleanness. The most important thing to remember is that we are responsible for one another. Each one of us is his brother's keeper. We must look after self, after others, and thirdly, we are to be dependent on God. Now Jude concludes his letter with verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of him, his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So Jude said first, you should keep yourself from falling. And second, you should keep one another from falling. And then he finishes by saying three, that God is able to keep or to guard you from stumbling. After you have done everything that you can, and others have done everything that they can to keep you from falling, you must still depend on God to enable you to remain faithful. Brethren, we have divine aid on our side. Without God, we are not strong enough to endure. But with his unlimited help, we can stand in the presence of our his glory blameless with great joy verse 24 and we can be with God eternally our ultimate salvation it depends on our remaining true to the faith with which once for all delivered to the saints verse 3 you know when religious groups have been around for a while there is generally the tendency to downplay doctrine. They will say something like, doctrinal sermons are just too old-fashioned. An emphasis on love and personal feelings, as well as solving problems with a prosperity gospel, now take the place of a prior importance on the faith. Brethren, we can never, ever allow that to happen in the New Testament church. As important as it is to apply God's teaching to everyday life, we must always be determined to preach and to teach, to practice and to defend, and uphold the faith, that and that alone. If we abandon the faith, all other things, are meaningless in the long run. And if we do hold to the one faith, we can expect to experience what Jude calls our common salvation. Hey Jude, don't make it bad. And Jude did not. He talked about our wonderful common salvation. Now, the Greek word translated common here does not mean every day. Rather, it means shared, belonging to self. Now, this suggests that we are all saved in the same manner, and after we are saved, we all enjoy the same 
blessings. There are no second-rate citizens in the kingdom of God. Jews and Gentiles, slaves and masters, males and females, all are saved in the same way and all are blessed in the same way when they are saved. Furthermore, the idea of the common salvation also suggests that we are not one bit behind those who were saved in the first century, but equal to them. We are saved in just the same manner they were, and we enjoy the same kind of blessing that they enjoy. The Apostle Paul wrote, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all those who love his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. Paul was perhaps the greatest Christian of all, at least of the first century. So wouldn't you just love to receive his crown when you get to heaven? You can be given a crown. And that's what the apostle said. The crown of righteousness, which he's going to receive from the Lord, one like that will be given to all who love his appearance. That means it's for you as well as me. We will receive the heavenly reward, Paul, the other apostles, and all those from the first century Christians on have received. There is one way, that way in which our salvation is the common salvation. However, if we want to enjoy the salvation that they enjoy, to have the same reward that they receive, then we must obey in the same manner that they obeyed in order to be saved. Have you have believed in Jesus? Have you repented of your sins and been water immersed, baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of those sins? Having believed, the Apostle Peter said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, 38. Are we living faithful lives in accordance with the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints? you're not a child of God, that means you have not as of yet believed. And maybe you do believe, but you've not repented, and you certainly have not been immersed in water for the washing away, the removal of those sins. If you're at that point, then you need to do that this beginning, this morning, right now. Having done that, then you can, with the rest of us, contend earnestly for this one faith that Jude talks about and the rest of the apostles talk about, because there is but one faith. And you can become part of that with us and help us to contend, to defend it with all that we have in this community. So, the invitation is to end. You need to come forward and do what's right as together we stand.